And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Lion Wing Publishing, the madman behind behind the translations of works like Picaresque Roman, Convictor Drive, and, uh, coming soon, Fledge Witch, The Magical Apprentices of Elemeria, the one and only Bradley Hailstorm. How are you doing today, man? Hey, Mildred, I am doing well, sir. Thanks for having me back. I think it's been two years since I was on the show last, so I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I think the, I think the last time I had you on was when, shortly after the Convictor Drive Kickstarter had, had gone off. And of course, then I did my Valley of the Judge on, kick, on it dur during the transition between the beta to the full release. <laughs> Though, I think the beta that I had was all, was, all but go was all but gold, so it wasn't that much of an issue. Yeah, I think we cleaned up a couple things wording-wise, caught some errors, but yeah, that was pretty much the final thing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I skimmed over the setting stuff at the time for that because I felt that it. I felt that it would. That there wasn't a. There's not a whole lot to dissect when it comes to just dealing with lore. That's fair. Yeah. Um, Although. Yeah, it's interesting. I will appreciate this. It's nice to see. A, it's nice to see a game set in Yokohama instead of Tokyo for the umpteenth time. Yeah, man, you know, I loved that. That was, I mean, there were so many reasons why I liked Convictor Drive, but I, its lore was one of the primary things that really drew me to it. And yeah, I liked that, like, oh, finally, uh, a setting in Japan that isn't Tokyo. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was a fun project. This project, Fledgewitch, has been a very different project, and I'm excited to, uh, to talk about why this one was different and to uh, tell people what this game is all about. Yeah, so... Before I, so before I get get to that, there's one bit of na bit of um, naming catch up I have to I have to do just to make sure I don't sc I don't screw it up. Um, so last time last time around the the first two the first two projects that you ha that I've had you on to talk about were both done by Seagray. Um, is this an, is this another one of Seagray's projects or is this somebody else? Uh, this is this is different. So this is not Group S SGR. This is not C Gray. Uh, this is a, a design studio called Symbol House uh, by a uh, by a designer named Haifun San. And I can talk about Haifun San uh, a little bit more as we get into the show because uh, he's an interesting designer and he's got some cool things up his sleeve and and he's up and coming. And I can talk about what that actually means at some other point mm -hmm. uh, in the show. So the. So there's there's no sh there's no shortage of interesting material com coming out of the Japanese tabletop scene as we as you and I both know. Um, what drew you to want to tackle Fledge Witch? Good question. Um, so I never like to do the same project twice. Um, or the same type of project. Like I'm fine publishing supplements for previous projects. That's not what I mean. But like to be creatively interested um, in a project enough for me to pick it up, play it, learn it, decide, okay, I'm going to spend a bunch of money and time and resources on this thing to get it on Kickstarter and get this thing published. It has to be different from the last project that I did. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I was looking at Picaresque Roman, which was a very narrative heavy werewolf style uh, PvP VGM type of game, which was different in and of itself. When I went to Convictor, I said, okay, well, I want something a little bit more traditional. I don't want a ton of crunch, but I want enough crunch um, to be interesting. And hey, I like. I like Tokusatsu. Let's do that. So when I was looking at uh, a third project and I was scouting what I wanted that third project to be, I said, I need this to be something very different. Because although Picaresque Roman was very narrative heavy, it's a violent game. Uh, there's a lot of combat in it, even if you're not moving minis around on a board and doing the traditional combat that people think about combat when they think about tabletop RPGs. But there's a lot of narrative combat in that game. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of combat in Convictor Drive. And I said, I don't I don't want fighting. Like, I don't want to do the fighting thing right now. I want something very different. And so I knew that before even finding Fledge Witch. I kind of had that as one of the f the filters that I had checked 
uh, non-combat game. And, uh, and I kind of went to work in that area of the Japanese TTRPG market and uh, eventually found Fledge Witch and said, okay, this is a game about witches. It's very cozy. There's not any combat. I mean, you could, you could work combat into the game, but that's not the basis of what this thing is about. Um, it's, it's, it's like an all ages, very heartwarming studio, Studio Ghibli, Little Witch Academia kind of game. And I said, now this is different. This is interesting to me. These games take so much time and, and effort that, like, if I'm not totally invested in, and so I knew I needed something that would have me totally invested. Mm-hmm. And this was the game that you know I saw it. And although it wasn't the game I saw, it and I was like, okay, that's the one. It wasn't Love at First Sight or anything like that. But it was Love after several sights of several other things. And I said. Mm. I keep finding myself drawn to Fledge Witch. That probably means something. Let's follow this rabbit down the hole and see where it leads. Next thing I know, I'm editing the book. I haven't edited one of our TTRPGs before. I've proofread both of both of uh, Picaresque Roman and Convictor Dry, but I didn't do any of the editing. I did all the editing. I did all the editing for this book um, because I liked it that much. So I said I want to be involved in this in a new way. Um, and I've I've edited one of our previous line wing games. It was a card game, uh, but gun and nothing gun. like a role playing game. Yeah, it was gun and gun, um, but nothing, but not a role playing game. And I said, all right, let's do this. I like this so much that I want to be more uh, intimately involved with this one than some of the past ones. That's not to say that I didn't love all the past ones too, because I absolutely love them. But just something was different about this one, and I wanted to play a different a different role. Mm-hmm. So. With that, with that in mind, I know you brought up um, the works of Studio Ghibli, and I, su- I suppose the big one that comes to mind is going to be Kiki's Delivery Service and Little Witch Academia. But I w- but when I was going through some of the notes, I also got a bit of a um, Atelier series vibe. Yes, so um, it's it's funny that you mentioned that. Uh, we sent out a press release, I don't know, like five weeks ago or so. And in that press release, we identified Kiki's... Deli- I usually, um, like in my press releases, I break down different parts of the game. I talk about like the overview, the gameplay, I get into like, some classes, and then I'll go into... I actually have a section in the press release called Influences. And so in that section for Fledge Witch, I actually identified Kiki's. I identified Little Witch Academia. I identified Witch Had Atelier, the, the manga series. And... I identified the uh, Atelier JRPG video game series. So there is a lot of Atelier in, in this game. A lot. Yeah. Oh. Now, with that with that in mind, I will, no- I will note the only thing that was unsurprising to me, for reasons I've mentioned before, is that this is using a D6 system. If only because, well, a Japanese tabletop game using a D6 system. Do you have any idea how little that narrows it down? <laughs> yeah. But- yeah, no, I can't. I can't put D6 in the scouting search criteria because that eliminates exactly zero games. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I know which, that, in fact, that was, in fact, when we talked about Convictor Drive, I specifically pointed out that that's why I found it interesting because it wasn't doing that. It was doing D10s. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, as now as I, under, as I understand it, uh, the... The the main the main approach from the player end of things is that they are um, apprentice witches. I uh, yeah, you cut out there for a second, but I'm assuming you said as you understand it, the player characters are apprentice witches, right? Yep. Yeah, so they are. They're not the witches themselves. The GM actually um, is the GM of the game, but also role plays the witch uh, in the game. Mm-hmm. And so, the, like um, like Convictor Drive, and even like Picaresque Roman, the GM takes a very role outside of just being the storyteller and the facilitator of the session they are actually involved in in the in the session as a character um and and they are part of the story that they are helping tell which is also something that i always like as typically the gm of my own uh rpg game sessions i kind of get bored of being the one who gets to miss out on all the adventures i get to set up the framework of the adventure and that's about it right um and i you know i get to dabble around in npcs or whatever but to be kind of there with the the players working toward the same goal as the players 
is always interesting to me and so i like that this game gets the gm involved in that way and that the game is really based around players as the apprentices learning from their mentor from the witch and uh seeking the witch's approval and their praise throughout the game and so oftentimes the scenarios in fledge witch or the three especially that we've included in the game are very much so designed around you don't there's really no way to fail and they're more so designed around doing tasks uh in hopes of kind of gaining praise from the witch and so it has a a really cool positive uplifting dynamic um to the the gameplay structure and how everyone's interacting with one another at the table uh, it's another thing that i really liked uh, uh, about the game and yeah so you're not playing the witch you don't get to play the witch unless you're the gm but you get to learn from the witch and that's pretty cool mm -hmm. now because of because of that um, even though even though it's using a d a d six system, there's a multitude of ways on on how that can be on how that that can be replicated, uh, not replicated, um, presented. Like some 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 games are going to do roll some games are going to do roll under, some games are going to do hit base, some ga some games are going to do roll high. Um, what is the what is the approach to the d six system that um, Fledge Witch is going to have? Yeah, so, I mean, although it is a, quote, original D6 system, it kind of plays out in the same way that you would expect a lot of other D6 systems to play out, in that when when you're rolling, you're, you're adding to, you know, your rolls are adding to your stats so that you can uh, pass checks. Um, and, and there is some... There's some nuance to that. There's some intricacies to that that I don't want to get too in the weeds with for a podcast... Well, I think that could be a little boring, but um, I would say that I would say that coming into this game, um, it's a very accessible system. I mean, most D6 systems are, especially from Japan. That's kind of the whole purpose. Uh, Japanese players don't like to sit too long at a table, and so a system has to be pretty, um, pretty intuitive and accessible, and for people to be able to like learn it and play it within three hours um and that that very much so is on display here uh with fledge witch in fact you know i i think in many ways you spend this has been my experience anyway um you spend a lot of time creating your character in this game and in some ways i think that's kind of like one of the highlights of the game is the character creation because there's so much that goes into it and sure there's so much that goes into so much character creation in every single rpg there's nothing terribly unique about that but how this game handles character creation um and the roll-offs uh for character creation and, and and how you assign attributes but also disposition and demeanor attributes to your character through dice rolls at the beginning of the game during character creation is really cool so um so yeah uh Original system, easily pick upable. It's not a word, but it is now. Um, and I would say ten minutes. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things I did, one of the things I did notice is when it is when it comes to the six crafts, mm -hmm. which I I think some I think some people would would look at this and and say that that's the six types of magic, but. Because, but because of the grimoire thing, I suspect that it's not as straightforward as that. Um, yeah, it's not. It's although this game is accessible, it doesn't necessarily do things. Uh, this isn't like a paint by numbers type of system. Mm -hmm. um, it will take it will take systems and ideas that you're familiar with, and it will modify them and flip them on on their head a little bit. And so, the craft system is the core of the experience of this game so w when players are creating their character and then of course when they are role playing their their day in the life of the of their apprentice you are relying on these things called crafts crafts are broken into six categories of knowledge and techniques that are necessary to master in order to become a witch they'll effectively um they'll affect how many dice you roll when you make a check for instance and so um 
you know, the six crafts are summon craft, which deal with, um, it covers knowledge and techniques that allow you to call forth beings other than yourself, like familiars, fairies, that kind of thing, to sort of serve you and to act on your behalf. Uh, there's song craft, which helps you with chanting incantations. Um, and you can alter the mana around you through song craft. The, uh, the whole world is based uh, on this idea uh, that there's... able to do your your witch things um and so that's song craft there's potion craft which is more of crafting medicines gathering you know medicinal herbs with tools process processing them um you can think of potion craft as kind of like alchemy in, in a sense that's where you get a lot of the atelier vibes and the actual uh, gameplay mechanics itself there's tool craft which relates to um knowledge and techniques pertaining to crafting and the use of magical tools like flying brooms, animated dolls, crystal balls, magical swords, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Then there's Lovecraft, which isn't exactly what you, what you think of when you probably first hear. Uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, Lorecraft uh, in the game, which um, is uh, how you absorb knowledge from grimoires, how you decipher magical writings, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, I got Lovecraft on the brain, and people will find out why Lovecraft is on my brain in about six weeks. Um, <laughs> and, and <laughs> I'm int intricately involved in something else. But um, And then your last craft is your housecraft, and these are the ones that assist you in dealing with magical tools and supplies and avoiding accidents. Um, so... In this world, witches often live alone, and they live remote. They live secluded. Witches are not scary in this game, um, and they're not bad witches. Uh, but certainly, people have a a healthy, not fear, but they have a respect for them. But they also recognize uh, that witches are definitely different, and they harness a power that normal humans do not. And so they are often left alone. And because of that... Um, Lots of things can arise, obviously, when living alone, and that witches need to be able to deal with on their own, and that's where housecraft can come in. And so uh, the craft system's really cool. It, it has a nice, uh, you know, slant on a traditional uh, magic mastery type of system, uh, and it's it's one of the, the core elements of, uh, of the entire experience. Mm -hmm. So... In a in a lot of games that that go that go for that go for a light that go for a lighter touch, there's there's some there sometimes is a um, phase system in terms of how a typical day is going to work. Um, is there some is there something akin to that in Fledge Witch? Give that to me one more time. You're breaking up there a little bit. In a lot. In several games, I've, in several games I've seen that do the lighter approach, there's a bit of a um, phase system in terms of how the how the day progresses in universe. Is mm -hmm, there mm -hmm. something like that within um, Fledge Witch? Not really. Um, I, I'm trying to. Many ways, and in the instances in which I've been a part of, and then have observed, that has been kind of woven into the fabric of the the narrative. But um, you know, so like yes and no, I would say. Um, yeah, if you're looking at like a traditional phase system, I, I guess I would just say, well, yeah, there's there are phases in the game, and you do have to follow them, and they do play out over the course of your session and how your session is structured, whether that's over the course of a day, a week, or whatever. Then yes, um, that's exactly how that would play out. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the con one of the concepts I saw in the in the initial um, announcement was the concept of heart. I'd like you to go into that and how that works. Uh, yes. Okay. So um, let's talk about heart. Let me pull up my notes here so that I get this right. So um, there's this mechanic, which is just aptly called heart, uh, capital H heart, um, in which heart is essentially um, a character's, uh, their memories of their bonds with that they that they have forged with their teacher their witch and their fellow apprentices and so heart can be drawn upon to either 
uh, grant the player extra bonus dice or lower the threshold of success. Now, what's also interesting is witches have heart as well. So they have that they have that same mechanic that they can pull upon, which they can use to grant universal bonuses to all of their pupils. Um, and so therefore, every player can earn extra heart after each challenge based on how the GM or how the witch decides to use their own uh, heart attribute uh, f for the betterment of the group and for the betterment of the story. So um, kind of a, a cool little system there that, you, you know, takes a takes something a little traditional like that, that in and of itself, me explaining that no one's going to say like, oh, I've never heard of that before. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but how, how it is framed first off from a thematic standpoint, and then how and when it is used can really uh, create uh, an interesting dynamic in the flow of the game session with players and further um, encourages and plays off that idea that this is a game where everyone is working together toward a common goal yes there are going to be challenges there absolutely will be challenges and there will be failures people will fail checks uh consequences will occur as a result of failures uh but this is not at all a game where the gm is antagonistic toward the players in any way and the players certainly aren't that with one another either nor are they that way toward the witch and so heart really encapsulates yes it's a mechanic but it also sort of by itself defines it's the heart mechanic mm -hmm. yeah the thing now with that in, with that in mind when it comes to when it comes to developing the crafts, because I did see that you that it does gr that it does grant ma it does grant magical skills, and I'm guessing that I'm guessing that's going to be the key part when it comes to how the how the crafts are going to interact with the player is through magical skills. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and to that to that end, I suppose it would be fair of me to say that. The idea of of a spell list, like a lot of people have seen in um, role playing games, isn't really going to be a factor here, at least not in the usual sense. No, not at all. Um, in fact, that would probably run counter to what this game is trying to do at the table, mm -hmm. um, because that would this game is not an in the weeds type of game. Um, I know I used that term earlier, but I'm using it again to describe what this game isn't. Um, and so a, a, a spell list would get in the way of the flow and what this thing is trying to accomplish. And so, yes, there are magical skills. Um, there's a whole section of it. Page 16 and 17 go over magical skills. Um, but it's but it's literally only page 16 and 17 that go over the skills. Um, and there are six of them. <laughs> oh, you know, one per craft. And so... Uh, that's not to say that there isn't depth in in the in the, the craft system and the magical skill system, uh, but it really does try to streamline this experience and get players right into uh, the meat and potatoes of what this game is, and that's interacting, uh, overcoming challenges, getting praise from their teacher, and then praising one another as each apprentice kind of goes through their own journey in hopes of becoming a witch. And that starts, yes, with crafts, but also feeds into the, the magical skill system as well. And so... Um, you know, magical skills in this game, kind of at large, are abilities which can help apprentices find magical solutions to problems that arise during the game session. Um, and so that's how players are going to use these quote magical skills. This is not going to be uh, the magical uh, magical skill approach that you would think it would be if you come from a very traditional especially western and especially crunchy type of rpg experience yeah. you can throw that stuff out the window this is not that yeah though i get the feeling that that given given the given the themes that you're going for and given the approach that i see with its particular um style of magic would it be fair of me to say that this is one where in order, in order to really get, in order to really get um, things done when it comes to the magical skills, they're best they're best used in concert with each other. I.e., a lot of a lot of emphasis on teamwork. 
I lost you again there at the end. I heard that they are best used in, but I didn't hear in the answer. In concert with each other, i.e. an emphasis on teamwork. Oh, yes, absolutely. So that's not to say that when players come to the table that there can't... You don't have to have, like, one of every magical skill or one of every craft per apprentice to to get the thing done, whatever the challenge is or whatever the task is for that particular scenario or that session uh, that the witch sets for its princesses. But, um, and so, yes, utilizing the magical skills in conjunction with the other apprentices at the table and the skills that they have will absolutely help folks accomplish the task set before them. And at the same time, this thing isn't so locked into, well, you choose this skill and then I'm I'm going I'm going to I'm going to complement that by by choosing this craft and this skill and then you choose that skill and that's not like what this is trying to do. And so, uh certainly players will be helping one another and they will be utilizing what they're bringing to the table with their apprentice. Um and what their apprentice specializes in. But it's not the type of game where it's like you have to be have a very specific party build to be able to overcome whatever the challenge is. To answer your question directly, yes, uh, people will be using these things in concert of one another. Um, and at the same time, there's enough space at the table for players to build similar apprentices and still be able to get the job done. Mm-hmm. Now, the idea of the GM as a as a player character and and also filling the roles of the GM is definitely going to be something that a lot of people are going to have an adjustment period with. Not not going to say it's not going to say it's going to be ri ridiculously hard to do, but it is going to involve some hoops for a lot of folk, mm -hmm. especially since for so for a lot the idea of the GM PC is um, frowned upon. <laughs> So, um, it, within the GM section, are you planning on putting in, or are, is is there going to be advice on how to ha how to handle both roles? Yes, there is, and not only is there a section where we kind of prep uh, GMs for stepping into the witch's shoes. Um, in fact, there's a whole section about how each side of the table should step into the shoes of their specific role. Uh, the scenarios that we're including in the game give are like a, are an awesome introduction point for uh, GMs, especially GMs who have not played GM plus player character. Um, and these scenarios will set set the witches up set folks up perfectly with here's what you, here's what you need to keep track of here's what here's what you need to be mindful of here's what you can do in this situation here's the scenario and here are a couple ways that we would recommend that you play it uh you don't have to do this but if you're a first time player in the world of fledge witch do these things it'll make your job easier to learn this game and so I'll, there are absolutely some preconceived notions about GM playing a character, and I am well aware of that. And at the same time, that's one of the things that it's it's sort of a through line in all of the games that I've chosen so far. So I personally have a proclivity towards systems that allow for that kind of thing because I like it, right? Um, and as the guy who's scouting these games and choosing the games, I tend to choose the, the ones <laughs> that I like um, and, and then just hope that other people like them as well. Of course, in the future, in 2024, we have a lot of GM-less games coming. Um, but, yeah, there are absolutely pages, sections of this book dedicating, dedicated to getting new witches, new GMs of this type, up and running and comfortable in the role. Mm -hmm. Now, going, for, going further into that... Um, I I do rem I do remember I th I think it was either Convictor Drive or Picaresque about a about a um, story seed generator, and I'm curious if that if that's going to be present in um, Fledge Witch. Um, a little bit. Uh, th there is I'm pulling it up right now. Flipping to that section, there is. So you're thinking of Convictor Drive and um. Yes, there is that here, though not as robust. Mm -hmm. 
Which, given that this is meant to be a lighter af affair, definitely makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, now, I saw I saw in the preview that you sent that characters would get um, would get two would get access to two of the crafts at level one, and then two others at level two. Mm -hmm. um, and through and through that, gain magical skills. Given the light affair of of the game, I'm guessing the to the total level isn't going to be going very high. But are there are is there more than one skill that's going to be available to each craft, or is it going to be one, is it going to be a one per craft thing? It's a one per craft thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, that ma that given given what's going on, that definitely makes sense. So so would it be fair to? I know a lot of Japanese tabletop games have a leaning to leaning towards one shots. Mm -hmm. um, is the, is this going to be in that in that same vein, or or could this be used to do a more long form campaign? I lost you there for a second, but I, I think I got the gist of what you're asking. So, yes, uh, you know the Japanese tabletop role playing game scene absolutely loves their one shots. Um, what's interesting about this game is, yes, it is absolutely a great game for one shots. And at the same time, so we're including three sample scenarios uh, in the book, and you can play each of those scenarios independently of one another. And at the same time, those three sample scenarios are actually meant to be strung together into a small campaign um, across three different play sessions. Um, from what's going on thematically in those three scenarios, there's a narrative through line, a very, very clear narrative through line, um, that if I just kind of like skipped to the ending and gave and totally spoiled what's in the book, people would say like, oh yeah, okay, I can see how all three of those scenarios would, would probably be best, not needed, but best played, um, one after the next consecutively, uh, but yeah, uh, one shot. The the one shot approach is absolutely on display here, and so we're we're not getting too crazy in the world of Japanese TTRPGs, where we're bringing over a game that is not uh, designed around accessibility and being able to just tell a self contained story in one session. But I would also say, like Convictor Drive, more so than picaresque Roman, certainly. Uh, the game can absolutely be strung together to create a campaign with very little effort to do so. Uh, so if you want to play like that, if you want to string together scenarios and create a, a larger campaign, you can. It Because of the natural constraints about the leveling system and the character customization and character growth, you won't be able to probably get more than five scenarios, uh, five sessions out of a campaign. Um, but it's there. It's there to do that. Whereas Picaresque Roman is it's it's kind of hard to do that. Actually, our first game is it's it's hard to get five five sessions out of that game. Much easier with Convictor Drive, and you can do it here too. But going beyond that, you're probably going to struggle with how do you work within the constraints of the system um, while telling a longer tailed story. It definitely can be done. You would just have to work at it. Mm -hmm. And. A G a GM who who has an idea of what they're doing will fi will figure out a way to do so. <laughs> but of course, always. With that in, with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as far as the page count? Because I remember with um, Convictor Drive, it was kind of a director's cut of of the original. Yeah, we're doing the same thing here. So we did. All of our games have effectively been director's cuts of the original Japanese release. And therefore, all of our games, content-wise, have been longer than the original releases. Now, when you look at page counts, it never quite feels that way, just because uh, you know the Japanese, uh, the Japanese language can say a lot more with a lot less characters. And so um, you can't compare page counts to say, like, oh, well, it's a director's cut, but it's actually shorter than the Japanese version? Well, how's that a director's cut, then? Yeah, well... We are adding in a bunch of new content, as we have with Convictor Drive and Picaresque Roman. We're doing the same thing here with Fledge Witch. We are adding in uh, more scenarios. We're adding in new lore. We've added in new art. We've totally reformatted um, the the page layout. 
in and of itself. What's different about this book than Convictor and Picaresque is this is an A5 size game. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of our previous games have been B5 size, which is about a 7 by 10 inch book. This is A5 size, so it's much closer to that of uh, manga or more specifically a light novel size. Mm -hmm. This was done for a few reasons. One, the the whole purpose of this game is accessibility. And nothing is more accessible than a smaller book, right? Um, and so we wanted people to be able to carry this and uh, and transport it with ease without it getting in the way. This is a great uh, one-off game that you can play in between your sessions of your heavier games. And so having a smaller book is easier to take with you when you're carrying a bunch of other books with you if you're going to play something else. And at the same time, um, and we haven't made an official press release about this yet. We are, we're actually waiting for the distributor to do that beforehand. Um, but we we did become a client of a, of a very, very large um, book distributor mm -hmm. that uh, deals with manga and light novels, but also deals with uh, role-playing games and just traditional books, traditional novels, whatever. And um, w with them we decided that all lion wing releases going forward starting with fledge Witch, will actually be a five size uh, because our games will be housed in the manga and light novel section of bookstores mm -hmm. and so uh to fit in with those books uh, you typically don't want to be larger than all the other books around you um because if you are larger than all those other books you have a chance that the bookstore shelves you in the game section and that's not necessarily our target demographic with these so a5 size was chosen um for those two reasons specifically and while it pains me as someone who likes to line shit up on a shelf and have it all look standardized and to have this book smaller than our previous two releases kind of like hurts hurts me a little bit on the inside. I'm happy with how it turned out. And I will say, if you are someone like me who wants Lion Wing games, Lion Wing books, and you want all the Lion Wing books to be the same size, well, we're going to have an option for you with this campaign. So um, not all hope should be lost just yet on that front. Mm-hmm. Nope, there's going to be no case of abandoned hope, ye who enter here. <laughs> Very good. So, with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Uh, April. And that's uh, we're pr that's probably a month overestimated. Uh, we actually are expecting these things to, to make uh, landfall here in the U.S. in March. Um, and for copies to be going out to backers in March, but we are going to uh, officially be targeting April as when backers can get their books, and then shortly thereafter for a retail release. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to that. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to the temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Mildra. Um, yes, good questions. And, you know, it's an opportunity to talk about Japanese RPGs in any place where I have the chance to scream into a megaphone about the need for Japanese role-playing games and the quirkiness of them um, and why they are so cool. Uh, I'm always grateful for that chance and to the folks who provide me that opportunity. And, uh, you know, while I have seen more and more support and more and more interest in the Japanese role-playing game scene, um, it still it still needs uh, a lot of attention. You know, we still need to hang a lantern on it so that people know that these games are being made in the, in the East, and that they are really cool, and that they do things and they have systems that are familiar to make people feel comfortable, and at the same time are doing things either within those systems or to complement those systems. That when all put together create a very cool very different kind of role-playing game experience and we need that um across all mediums we need options and we need 
things that kind of break the mold in interesting ways. And I think Fledgewitch, the things that we've done before it, and then all the stuff that we've we've coming we have coming down the pike for the rest of this year in 2024 and 2025, I think very much so will help show people that, hey, these are the games being made in Japan. And uh here's why you should check them out. And so you've given me the platform to be able to talk about this one here just as you have the previous ones. And I'm looking forward to coming on again in the future to talk even more. And anytime you see fit to return or about the... Japanese tabletop role playing games. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!